Omanu Preschool in Mount Maunganui goes above and beyond. All the teachers are qualified, experienced, and there's a high ratio of teachers to children. Knowing that your team and your manager has your back and is going to support you 100% through the day is just amazing. Um, hey Fergus, tell me, do you have a best friend teacher here? Geordie. That makes me so happy. Oh my gosh, you make me cry. Um, I love my job and for children to say that is amazing. That's all I want, is for children to have that teacher that they can have that trust in and yeah, that makes me so that makes me smile. The art space over here, creations, yeah. the science, and then the sleep spaces over there. Helen van der Merwe has been an early childhood teacher for 18 years. She manages the centre and, with the support of the owner, makes sure it runs to a high standard. But some of the daycares she's worked at in the past have had a much lower quality of care. There can be, in some of them, a big focus on profit over children. Teachers are just told to suck it up and get on with it and the children are just seen as a dollar sign. How do some centres try to cut costs? Um, I have heard of services that have um, cut corners around food. They don't want to put extra into ensuring that the children are given the right amount of food um, to sustain their bodies. They'll underfeed them. Pretty much, yeah. To save money? Yeah. She says some centres cut corners with other supplies too. I have had communication with a teacher where uh, there was a discussion around whether the child needed um, to stay in their nappy that they came in the day because there wasn't any extra nappies. Leaves them in their wet nappies all day? Yeah. And the centre so, didn't pay for any or have any yeah. backstop available? Yeah. Yeah. Helen says one of her former managers told her off when she tried to tell a parent their son had fallen off a sandpit and hit his head. She had a complete meltdown around it and she said, I told you that I didn't need that to be written up. Look at the amount of work that you're making me do now because I have to go and report that. So there's a real sense that um, certain things parents don't need to know. The legal minimum ratio for kids two and above is one teacher to ten children. But Helen says she's worked at several centres that cheat the system. I have had up to 17 children by myself at one go, outside in the play space, um, and no other adult around. And then when asked for support, I was told this is ministry ratios. You're OK. We've got enough adults in the building. But that's um, well below minimum legal ratio. Yeah. yeah. Through using a loophole. Yeah. How common is that? It's very common. Wow. Yeah. I think that would strike fear into the hearts of parents around New Zealand. Helen is a passionate advocate for improving ratios because even when centres do operate at the legal bare minimum, it's not enough. It's just a lot of crying, a lot of unsettled children. You'll have teachers running around just not knowing where to plug the hole at that space. I have been in those situations where I did feel like a sense like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? Um, because you can't get to all the children in one go. So it's carnage, basically? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You can't operate quality engagement and care on ministry ratios. It's just not safe. Internally, you just want to scream because it's just not good enough. There are 220,000 Kiwi babies and toddlers in early childhood education right now. They are looked after by 4,500 ECE centres, play centres, kindies, kōhangareo and home-based care. ECE centres, daycare, are by far the biggest, more than half. Most daycares are businesses. They get government funding, the famous 20 hours free, and they get fees from parents. 
a lot of fees. New Zealand parents spend the most, the most on childcare out of all the countries like us. Look at us, right up there. Now, when the 20 hours free policy came out in 2007, the costs parents paid did almost half initially. But by 2012, they were right back up again as the national government decreased per child funding and centres found ways to charge parents more. And they have stayed way up ever since. Now, our regulations here are really quite loose too. Here's these ratios that we talked about earlier. For kids over two, centres need a ratio of one teacher for every 10 toddlers. And it's one teacher for every five babies aged under two years old. It's effectively one person looking after quintuplets all day long. Now, in Australia, each teacher is only in charge of four kids under two. Then there's group sizes. There is no limit whatsoever. It is not uncommon to have groups of up to 50. Now, experts say small kids aren't capable of recognising 50 people. It stresses their brains. Now, if a centre is not looking after kids properly, they'll have their licence to operate made provisional. The number of centres on that shit list has almost tripled since 2016. There are 208 on it right now. And centres are dropping like flies. Ten years ago, 40 or 50 services closed each year. Over the last 12 months, there were 232 closures. So it's a sector in chaos, in crisis. Nearly everyone is suffering. The parents, the teachers, the businesses. But don't worry about them. It's the kids that matter. And our kids are suffering. And on top of everything we just heard, would you believe there are places in New Zealand where you can't even get daycare? Black spots. Now, Yannicka is going to take us to a town of more than 5,000 people with no daycare available to meet a mother who is desperate. Cromwell is an attractive and fast-growing central Otago town, but there's a big setback for families who live here. It's a childcare desert. Wait lists are three years long. The centres here are getting up to 10 desperate inquiries from families every week, and they just can't help them. They're closing their wait list because someone inquiring about care for a two-year-old at the moment would be unlikely to get a spot for that child until their school age anyway. I emailed every single place that I could in Cromwell. Everywhere was the same. Um, we can put you on a list to get put on a waiting list. So essentially it was like a, a waiting list to be on a waiting list. Let's go. Let's go. You go to this India? Cassie has managed to get part-time spots at kindy for four-year-old Ariana and two-year-old Sophie. But that was years ago. With four-month-old Mila, it's a completely different story. So when did you sort of start calling around? It was just straight away, as soon as I was pregnant. Most of the centres said, well, sorry, your child's not born yet, or there's no point because our waiting lists are so long. Cassie is desperate to get back to work. Even with her partner working as a heavy machinery operator, the family needs more income to cope with the cost of living. By the time we've paid off, uh, you know, the, the rent, the food, gas, car, you name it, insurance, everything on top of that. You know, like, we, we're just surviving at the moment. For three months, she worked nights, waiting tables. It was just exhausting. I would get home at two in the morning, most nights, and still have to feed my middle child, get tend to her, and then when I'd get up in the morning at five, um, I'd be starting my day and then doing it again, starting work at six. I couldn't keep up with it. I wasn't able to be the mother that I wanted to be because I'd wake up and I'd be so exhausted. You know, I wouldn't want to go for walks. I didn't want to take my children to the park. I don't think any mother should have to be a full-time mum during the day and then have to work six hours during the night and then come back and be a full-time mother and over and continuous until we burn out, essentially. Does it taste yummy? Would you say that you feel trapped? Is that a good way to characterise it, that feeling of not? Yeah, helplessness. Like, I would say it's helplessness. I feel like I can't help my family. And it's not because I don't want to, it's just because I can't. 
We're here in the company coast and we're off to see Bethany. The company that she works for has just had to shut three of the four daycares that it owns and this is the latest closure up here. It's just been turned into a residential property. So we're off to meet her at the last remaining centre that's still open. Bethany O'Hagan is running this preschool now, but she was the manager at the last centre to close. It shut about a year ago. Do you remember the moment that you knew it was over? Uh, yep, yep, I still remember it, yep. Yep. Oh, no, no, that's OK. What was running through your head when you found out? Oh, it was heartbreaking. It was really, really heartbreaking. I guess it's an industry that we don't get in it for uh, anything but because we're passionate about what we do. So obviously, when you hear that it's not going to ever exist anymore, it's heartbreaking. With only a few weeks' notice, parents had to scramble to find alternative care, and many found it quite unsettling. I've seen him grow up, so it's very much been helping raise a family, the centre, so that's very important to me. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. It's quite jarring to have your child in an environment that you really love, um, and they're very settled and very secure, and then all of a sudden you have to come up with a plan B. Some parents couldn't find another centre with vacancies, so the local school agreed to take the four-year-olds in early. The reason for the closures comes down to money. The smaller and independently owned centres are finding it harder and harder to remain financially viable. It made you angry that the sector that's so apparently so important, as all research shows, is not is just getting overlooked and such amazing little centres are just closing left, right and centre. How would you describe the system as it is right now? Absolutely devastatingly broken. Um, yeah. And it's at the point that so many just can't be in this industry anymore because we're not able to be a teacher anymore. We can't actually yeah, be happy about coming and doing what we're doing because it is so, so broken. Kathy Wolfe represents ECE providers and fears if something isn't done soon, more and more centres will have to close. Many are making very hard decisions and it's breaking. I mean, I've heard of services who've remortgaged their homes to keep their businesses open and that's not what we want. We want to just have a meaningful funding system um, so early childhood services can actually focus on providing high quality education and care. We don't want owners to be worrying about financial stresses of where their revenue is coming from or how they're going to fund that gap without increasing their fees too much that they know their parents can't afford. The gaps between, so the gap is between the investment we get from the government and what we get from parents' fees or not. And so it's not adding up. It's not adding up. And that's where the hard decisions are being made by the services in terms of either closing or charging more fees to parents. What do we need to do immediately to make early childhood education safer in this country? First of all, we've got to improve the ratios, get rid of the one to five ratio for children under two and move immediately to one to four that is critical because that's the most dangerous thing we have in the sector. In infancy, there's a part of our brain, um, particularly the amygdala, um, but the emotional centres of the brain that are in their calibration stage. They're, they're learning what do I have to respond to, when am I OK, when am I not OK? And we're putting children into environments that are saying, you are not OK, you are not OK. We're reinforcing anxiety in children. We're hardwiring it. And we've got to stop doing that. We have to have emotionally secure environments for our babies and our toddlers. The next step is get rid of the 1 to 10 ratio for toddlers, move to a 1 to 8 with group size controls. And there's absolutely no limit on group sizes, is there? Group size is a real big issue. Sometimes that can mean group sizes of over 50 children under five years old great big groups of infants and toddlers. That is crazy. 
It becomes chaotic in terms of relationships. It means that children who are overstimulated are going to act out a lot more, be harder to manage. They will impact on other children. Quieter children, some of those may be the ones really needing attention, they get lost in the crowd. The other is that we've got to get rid of the archaic, not fit for purpose licensing system. At the moment, the licensing system favours the worst providers because it encourages poor quality. There's no incentive for quality in the current system. To turn this around, there's no question it has to be properly funded. But at the moment, the sector is also bleeding money to a small proportion of owners who are taking a huge amount of profit. So you can make huge money in the sector, and there are people making tens of millions of dollars a year in the sector, operating at minimum standard. But if you try to do quality for children, you're going to financially struggle. We have very poor regulations, poor monitoring of that. The Ministry of Education just doesn't monitor the regulations properly. They don't check ratios. Um, so we need much better regulations, better monitoring. That's mm. child safety.